Hello, I'm Sharon Tong. Welcome to In Parliament. Today, the Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister took time to respond to 65 MPs who spoke over the last three days on the budget. He focused on three key areas. First, responding to feedback from MPs on SMEs and how the sector will get special attention, particularly on how to improve productivity so as to cope with increasing costs and the reduction in foreign worker growth. Then he tackled the issue of income inequality and the many suggestions by MPs on how to help the less well-off. Clarifications were also made on why public funds were being used to pay for more buses. The finance minister started his reply by focusing on the SMEs. He said SMEs form a critical part of the economy and deserve special attention as Singapore restructures. Even as he assured SMEs that the government will help them cope, he explained why efforts to reduce Singapore's dependence on foreign workers must push through at the current pace. Some others were concerned, and understandably, Mr. Teo Song Singh, uh, Mr. Indijit Singh, Madam Lee Biwa, concerned about whether SMEs would be able to cope and whether we are moving a bit too fast. Mr. Lo Chia Kyung, Mr. Chen Shou Mao, I think now recognise that we have to maintain a very careful balance in how we go about our foreign worker policies. I think you've shifted your position because I've checked up what you said previously. 2010 debates, 2011 debates and budget debates, also your Workers' Party manifesto instantly in last year's general elections, where you criticised the government for allowing in too many foreign labor, uh, workers. I think your position now accords with ours and recognises that this is a very careful balance. It's a careful balance, first, because we do have to be concerned about that complementarity between foreigners and Singaporeans and concerned with ensuring that Singaporeans keep their jobs and their incomes continue to grow. Too quick a withdrawal of foreign workers will hurt our SMEs and they won't be able to cope with the pace of change. But if we are too slow in tightening on foreign worker policies, the incentive to upgrade will also be lessened. And we will face, as Mr Lim Sui says, says, even bigger and longer term problems further down the road. So it's a very careful balance that we have to maintain. We are going to go out of our way to reach out to SMEs, hold their hand, work with the business associations, work with the enterprise development centres, work with the CDCs. Proactive, not just waiting for them to come. We are really going to go out to look for them and help them to take advantage of our schemes. And in response to the many MPs who spoke on social policy and income inequality, Mr Taman said social and economic policy are closely bound. He outlined four strategies in the budget and the government overall approach to tackle this. The first, to grow the economy so as to raise income levels across all segments. The second, to preserve and enhance social mobility starting from young. Another strategy is to encourage a partnership with the community through helping voluntary welfare organizations organizations and community development councils and finally to redistribute benefits to the lower income without placing too much of a tax burden on the middle income. Quite apart from growing incomes and doing what we can to grow social mobility, we will have to redistribute through a fair system of taxes and benefits. That's there in all our budgets and it is very much there in this year's budget. Provides significant benefits for the low income group to help them keep up and upgrade but avoid placing an excessive burden on the middle income group. For the lower income, he says redistributing benefits to this group is not a new approach. He rejected the suggestion by Mr Lao Tia Kiang that the budget is a post-GE budget and that the government is doing something new. Mr Taman added over the last five years, the government started workfare and comcare and enhanced housing subsidies, schemes specifically targeted for the lower income, which has produced real outcomes. Let me say that this is a, not a new focus in the budget. An inclusive growth or an inclusive society is not a new focus in the budget, as Mr Faisal Ibrahim had pointed out, <clears throat> and um, Mr Lim Biao Chan just a short while ago had emphasised. We have made major moves in the last five years, major interventions in the last five years. Workfare and Comcare 206, 207, enhancing uh, housing subsidies very substantially, uh, so I'd like to assure Mr. Gerald Gum, who might not have uh, caught up with uh, all the developments, that our housing subsidies are such that a family with $1,000 of income can 
Now, through our housing subsidies, purchase a small flat. And of course, if you have 1,002 or 1,005, you can purchase a medium-sized flat. How much is $1,000 of income? That captures about 98% of our younger cohorts, those who are below 35. So you're concerned about you know, younger people being unable to afford a flat. Try and catch up on what we've been doing. The housing grants we've been giving, more aggressive than any other government would give. And for those who really can't afford it, the 2% or so, we have other schemes to help them. And we must find other schemes to help them. But home ownership is a very important plank of how we're helping our low-income group and helping them accumulate savings over time. So that was a major uh, intervention in the last five years. Education subsidies, especially the tertiary level, and health subsidies, again, we expanded it significantly. What do taxes mean and what do transfers and benefits mean over a lifetime for a low-income household? And if you add it all up together, you'll find that for every dollar that a low-income household pays in taxes, they get back, they get back more than $4 in benefits. A whole set of benefits, workfare, housing benefits, health care benefits, education subsidies, a whole set of benefits. In the last five years, the transfers we provided to the low-income group, net of the taxes they pay, which is basically GST, transfers net of taxes amounted to almost 20% of their incomes, equivalent to 20% of the incomes, a significant increase from the previous five years. So we've moved significantly in the last five years through a range of interventions towards addressing the issue of inequality and building an inclusive society. It is not new. This is not post-GE 2011. But Mr. Taman added that benefits and transfers given to the low income must not end up as disincentives. MPs like Mr. Ang Hin Kee and Mr. Edwin Tong had raised concerns about making sure Singapore does not end up a welfare state. Mr. Taman agreed, saying that the government should be careful about extending benefits beyond 20% of the income of the less well-off. It is natural human behaviour that you have an incentive to stay where you are and not upgrade and start losing your benefits. Every society has found this to be a problem. As you expand benefits, more people try to stay within the group that gets the benefits instead of upgrading beyond that threshold. So we've got to be quite careful, preserve that drive to do better, to learn a new skill, and to have your whole family move up. Because that drive at every level of Singapore society has defined us. It's not just that most talented people or the most well-educated who have this drive. Actually, that drive amongst ordinary working Singaporeans has defined us. So let's not lose that. And it means being focused in our interventions as we go ahead. While targeting benefits is a key approach to helping those who need it, Mr Taman rejected suggestions to extend the Special Employment Credit Scheme, or SEC, to more groups. These include homemakers, ex-offenders and single mothers. These groups, he said, should be helped through other means. The SEC, the Special Employment Credit, is a major intervention in the job market. A major intervention. And uh, not everyone faces the same disadvantage. There are some homemakers who move in and out of work, they're not necessarily at a disadvantage when they come back. So I'd be very careful about extending what is a major intervention in favour of older Singaporeans to more and more groups. And key to maintaining the programmes to help the less well-off is having a sustainable tax system. That's ensuring that subsidies are targeted to the less well-off while raising the real incomes of all. Particularly the middle income, who are mobile and the driver of Singapore's success. He shared using a chart that median households in Singapore have seen healthy income growth over the past five years at an average of 3.2% per year in real terms. This is frankly uh, quite rare as well, this 3.2% growth over the last five years. Uh, in Hong Kong and Taiwan, it was negative over the last five years, median income growth in real terms. Korea, positive but lower than us. And of course, most developed countries um, had significantly lower real median income growth over the last five years. So we haven't done badly. 
A key feature in enabling the middle income is to keep taxes low. Mr Tauman says this is a very important feature of Singapore's tax system, which produces unique outcomes and is lower than most developed countries. He gave the example of how a middle income family, which owns a car, gets about 80 cents back for every dollar in taxes they pay. And the benefits are more for those who don't own a car. If you don't own a car, even as a middle income Singaporean, you get back $1.50 for every dollar tax you pay over your lifetime. And there are very few systems that provide this. Very few systems that provide this. And for those who want to have a car for the convenience or because they have a large family or with elderly persons that need ferrying around, um, it's still a very fast system. There are very few systems where for every dollar of tax you pay, you get 80 cents back over your lifetime for the average household. And a key item the government will spend more on is health care, which will be a long-term trend expenditure, likely to rise to 3.5% of GDP in 2030. While spending more on health care, he rejected calls by the Workers' Party's chairman to spend 6.1% of GDP on health care, as in the OECD countries, as this means taxes will have to rise significantly. Outcomes instead are more important. If it's GST, it has to rise to about 20%. If it is corporate income taxes, it will have to rise to above 40 percent. Currently, 17 moved to above 40. If it is personal income taxes, it will have to rise across the board with the top line rate moving to about 60 percent. Mr. Lo Kyang also spoke about first world social safety net. I think you were congratulating us for moving to a first world safety net. I felt very intimidated when you said that. <laughs> Because I don't like the idea of this first world safety net. Because it means first world taxes and first world debts. And I don't like both ideas. And I think all of us here have an inherent dislike for the level of taxes or the level of debts that come with a first world social safety net. As for the strategy on working with the community to tackle inequality, Mr Tauman refuted the charge made by opposition MP Sylvia Lim, who said the government had taken the back seat in this area. Mr Sylvia Lim, I think, may have overstated things when she said that the government is taking the back seat and leaving things to the VWOs. Quite the contrary. There is, in fact, no government that is as aggressive as us in supporting the VWOs working with them. I mean, if you just look at our fiscal schemes alone, the Community Silver Trust, we set aside $1 billion. That, together with our tax deduction scheme for donations, means that for every dollar a VWO receives, in fact, 60% came from, from the government through a matching grant from the Community Silver Trust as well as the tax deduction scheme. Every dollar a VWO receives, it is actually 60 cents that comes from the government. And that's the way we encourage everyone to join in. More people should contribute to our VWOs and not leave the task only to the government. The Deputy Prime Minister also spent some time tackling the $1.1 billion bus question. He tackled concerns from MPs that the huge subsidy to public transport operators could end up as profits for shareholders. Providing 550 additional buses, he said, was aimed at stepping up bus service levels well beyond the current service standards that are required of the PTOs. This means commuters can look forward to shorter waiting times and less crowded bus journeys. It would also help to improve improve connectivity and provide commuters with more public transport choices. This is in addition to the $60 billion the government is spending to improve the rail network, which will take time to realise. We cannot simply mandate that the PTOs add these 550 buses to improve service levels. First, because it goes significantly beyond the current service levels, the service levels of the current regulatory framework. Second, the PTOs bus operations are already running operating losses. And the 550 additional buses in particular are projected to be a loss-making operation. The cost of acquiring and running the 550 buses are beyond what can be, revenue, what can be recovered through revenues from these buses. Mr Tarman added that if not for the government's intervention, the service level improvements would only have been achievable if fares had been raised sharply. Fair revenues of the PTOs would have had to go up by about 12 to 13 per cent, which translates into an increase in passenger fares of about 15 cents per journey if the PTOs had had to achieve this on their own. 
how much is 12 to 13 percent? In the last five years, since 2006, fares went up by 0.3 percent. So 12 to 13 percent is quite a significant leap compared to what we've seen in the last five years. Despite this package, Mr. Taman says regular and incremental fares will continue to be necessary as wages and operating costs rise and promised that the needy will get adequate help to meet this rising cost. Now, wrapping up his reply, Mr. Taman said MPs have voiced strong support for the budget, but he noted that building an inclusive society will always be a work in progress. We do not claim to have a perfect system, but we are not doing badly. Median incomes have risen faster in the last five years than any of our peers in Asia, the NIEs or Japan, or any of the developed countries. Our unemployment rates are the lowest in Asia, and certainly the lowest amongst developed countries. <coughs> Social mobility through education remains higher than in most other countries, certainly most of the developed countries. Home ownership remains the highest in the world, and in particular, home ownership amongst our lower income group is without equal internationally. After Mr. Taman's speech, opposition MP Lao Tia Kiang got up to clarify the minister's comment that the Workers' Party had shifted from its previous position that Singapore did not need foreign workers. Mr. Lao said the party had never communicated this position in its speeches or manifesto, but its main complaint was that foreigners were taking away Singaporean jobs and depressing wages. He also didn't agree with the Deputy Prime Minister's approach to reduce the dependence on foreign workers and felt a more targeted sectoral approach was needed and responded also to Mr. Taman's comment that a first world social safety net would mean first world taxes and debts. So I suppose the DPM know very well that the first world country social safety basically looking at how to ensure that their own citizens are well looked after, whether in terms of health care, in terms of uh, retirement, so these are things that we are looking to do. Of course, I understand the government is particular about outcomes. And the challenge exactly to this government is can we have the outcome of the social safety net in the Western country, in the first world country, without the same level of tax that we can have? <laughs> well, on, on your last uh, hope, I suggest you write a novel on this. <laughs> Uh, it will sell very well in the West. But let me address your questions in turn. Uh, first, um, uh, the Workers' Party has said, uh, and I remember vividly the debates, uh, and I know what was in your manifesto, uh, you did feel that we had let in too many foreign workers at the low end, lower skill, low end. Uh, your recent comments, however, in this debate, uh, express great concern over how fast we are tightening our dependency ratio ceiling for work permit holders and did recognize that even at the lower end this has to be a very careful balance and that I think shares our perspective. Uh, I hope this sting you've taken out of your earlier criticisms is not just a political strategy because you know that there's sensitivity on the ground amongst SMEs and so on about having to restructure but also recognizes the more basic reality which is that the growth of foreign workers in Singapore has not only benefited SMEs, but it has benefited Singaporeans' incomes. I've shown the data three years in a row. Low-income Singaporeans, middle-income Singaporeans. What has happened? Yes, there will always be competition in individual jobs. But overall, when you look at the dynamic that is created in our economy, Singaporeans have benefited, and have benefited more than other countries have. Than almost every country I showed on the chart. Right? So it has been a successful strategy. And that was the reason why you were wrong in criticizing the government for a strategy of allowing companies to stay competitive and grow using foreign workers. Second, on micromanagement, you know, this is a practical issue. I think you made the suggestion with the best of intentions. And when you meet businessmen, they will often ask you, hey, why not give me a bit more? You know, my business is one where I really cannot attract Singaporeans. It's too far, they won't come, or the, the work is too dirty, and so on. How did businesses in Germany, the Mittelstand, become what they are today? 
It is by constant upgrading. Why are they able to beat lower cost competitors in China? It is by constant upgrading so that a dirty job became a cleaner job, more skills, more knowledge. So our challenge, as Mr. Lim Suisei said yesterday, is restructuring is unavoidable. The alternative is even more painful. Let's work with the SMEs to help them restructure. There's no easy solution to this. So I, I think you made it with the best of intentions, but I pointed out that the result of that approach will be faster foreign worker growth, lower productivity growth, and thirdly, some inequity between firms, some unfairness between firms, which I'm sure you didn't intend, but that will be the outcome of that strategy. Third, on the issue of first world safety net, the truth of the matter is that this has not just been an aspiration of first world governments to provide this high level of uh, this high level safety net for their citizens. It has inadvertently been a trick on future generations. They've postponed the bill to future generations precisely at the wrong time, precisely at a time when the working population is getting smaller relative to the older population. Some people knew it, but went about it because that was in the nature of single-term democratic politics, where you don't look beyond what happens in one term. And many people didn't know about it. Populations were fooled. And now populations are paying the price, which is why it is not just a matter of financial crisis that they're going through, but a social crisis that's going to last for many years. So let's avoid getting anywhere even close to that. The GPC Chair for Transport, Mr. Cedric Fu, also rose to ask for clarification on the $1.1 billion to fund public buses. He asked if the projection of losses by the public transport operators were merely an assumption, reflecting concern perhaps about the potential profits made by the PTOs. Ridership can change in many ways. As networks are added, you may have more people travelling on it. We may be very successful as a tourism hub. Would you which the DPM ring fans this particular injection and the profit and loss from this particular injection and adjust for it as necessary. We expect them to make losses based on all existing parameters. If we are lucky and if somehow the system is re-engineered so that the losses are less than expected or most unlikely, but if they turn a profit, that will not come from the government. None of the $1.1 the $1 billion will be reduced as their losses are reduced, and if they make a profit, it all comes back to us. So none of the $1.1 billion will go towards profits for the public transport operators. It will be ring fence, it will be scrutinized, their, their accounts will be scrutinized, that we'll be paying according to what the costs actually are, right? There's a review at five years to check the parameters for the agreement, but, you know, there's no reason why we would want to subsidize the profits of the public transport operators. There's no reason why you'd want to do it. We are doing this to help consumers. This is a subsidy to consumers so that as we are waiting for the major expansion of our rail system, we can improve service levels on a daily basis. Parliament has approved the budget for the government's next financial year starting 1st April 2012. Members of the House then moved on to debate the estimates for the individual ministries. Under the Prime Minister's office, Deputy Prime Minister Tio Chi Hien announced measures to provide more help for parents with the cost of raising their child. Enhancements are being made to the child development account in the second half of this year. And under the Ministry of Home Affairs, Second Minister S. S. Warren said police cameras will be installed in all HDB blocks and multi-storey car parks by 2016. More MPs will be rising to debate the spending plans of the other ministries tomorrow. Good night.